Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the service this morning. It's happy to have you with us. Many of you are here for the first time. Great to have you with us. Thank you for joining with us. <clears throat> what a joy it is to be able to join together as a country of God's people to praise and to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, the word of the Lord is our read from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day his plans perish. Blessed is the one whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, Yahweh, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps, his, keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father who is in heaven, we indeed come into your presence to praise and worship you because you alone are worthy of glorious praise. You are great and above all gods, all creatures you have created praise and worship you. You do whatever you please and we are so grateful that you are in control of this world. There is nothing that happens without your knowledge. You are holy, you are just, merciful and loving. And we thank you for the privilege of knowing you and having a relationship wherein we can come to you no matter what our state may be, joyful or sorrowful, having plenty or battling to make ends meet, in sickness or in health. You know us intimately and we can come to you for strength and comfort in our times of need. We thank you for the privilege of... Excuse me. We thank you for the privilege we have to come together in this auditorium to praise and worship you and to hear you speaking to us through the reading and preaching of your word. May all that is done and said in this service this morning, bring glory and honor to you, our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Susan is now going to uh, read the public reading of Scripture as we worship God in this way as well as we hear God's word read to us. Corinthians 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in severe test of affliction, the abundance of joy and the extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of gener generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, 
and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace as well. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. For you know that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that through, sorry, that through he was, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had, not, had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal, but, he made, but being himself very earnest is going to you of his own accord. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that he has ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself to show our goodwill. We take this course so that no one should blame us, sorry, blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. And with them we are sending our brother, whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and of your boasting about you to these men. Thank you, Susan. Well, folks, as we come to the preaching of God's Word, won't you turn with me in your copy of the Bible to the portion of Scripture that Susan has already read for us this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We were tempted to read the whole of chapter 8 and chapter 9 because it just such, provides such a, w a wonderful context and framework for where we want to go this morning, although my particular attention will just be in the first couple of verses of the 8th chapter. But just to let you know, this is a divergence from our series in, in Malachi, but not so much of a divergence, but a supplement, just coming back to the theme that we considered last Sunday morning as we were in Malachi chapter 3. Uh, we're looking at verses 6 through to 12 on the idea of tithes and contributions and the failure of Israel in that particular regard. And I did say that the New Testament provides some wonderful balanced passages. It's unlikely we're going to get to a, a preaching series on 2 Corinthians anytime soon, so I thought it was helpful uh, just to loop back and to add a little bit of uh, balance and to shore in some of the gaps that I might, may well have unwittingly created last Sunday morning. But folks, if I may, just for a moment or two or three or four, uh, just preface where we're going to go this morning with a couple of comments, particularly for those that uh, might not have had the privilege of being with us last Lord's Day. I've mentioned already that we were in Malachi chapter 3, considering the issue of giving or non-giving within the nation of Israel. We saw in those verses last week how God challenged his people, his covenant people, who were back from exile, back in Israel, uh, busy rebuilding the temple and uh, the city and so forth, as to the issue of their failure to bring to the Lord that which was rightfully his. There was a pattern that had developed 
and the whole nation was culpable or guilty before God of robbing him, of stealing from him by not bringing their tithes and their contributions into the storehouses. They were guilty in terms of not sustaining the religious and the political space that they were supposed to be in. They were not uh, uh, supporting the Levites and the, the government workers, the civil workers, the priesthood, as it were, in terms of their, their giving. And uh, we saw that that was not just a matter of rands and cents or produce or goats or cows or wheat, but an issue of flawed worship before God because they didn't have a high regard for God, because they weren't fearing Him, because they had put uh, their relationship with God on the side. It was reflected in their attitude to the law of God, and they were forsaking His statutes, they were forsaking His laws, and God had clearly prescribed that His people were to give out of their produce a system of tithes and contributions that as we saw went far beyond what we typically think of 10% but came close to 23 if not 25% of a Jew's annual income that was supposed to be directed towards sustaining the nation in terms of what God had required from them. As we consider their failure in that particular way, we also saw the promises of God that if they got that right and they returned to him, return to me and I will return to you, is the phrase that brackets that whole section, God will open up the very windows of heaven and bless them in a tremendous way that every affliction that they were facing because of their disobedience, they would be relieved from. But just to recap, I made the case I hope clearly last week that I do not think that there is a strong case for tithing that draws from the Old Testament into the New Testament. I say that humbly because I know that there are a number of uh, godly and capable academics and scholars and commentators and pastors and have been through the centuries that would take a divergent position on that. But uh, I'm taking the view that we are not under the old covenant law in any way, and there is no explicit reference through the New Testament epistles as God through his spirit directs the authors to instruct the New Testament church on this issue of prescribed percentage-based tithing. Now, having said that again, and I will say it again and again this morning, uh, opinions do differ on this, and we need to rest on our own freedom of conscience as we come to this particular issue. We uh, want to stay friends and not be enemies, uh, but this is not a hill to die on. But whichever way we look at this issue of giving, either through the lens of tithing or th through the lens of new, uh, new Testament free will offering, we land on a very similar position. And we will see that this morning, that uh, we are required by God through whichever framework we use to be giving to the Lord's work. And so, folks, that's where we want to pick up this morning. On the issue of giving as an act of worship, giving to the Lord, giving to his kingdom, uh, giving as he requires from us. But I would contend not in a tithe tax, as it were, but uh, flowing from our own heart, uh, conscience, and conviction in those particular areas. I did promise last week that I would loop back to that. And so that's what we do this morning. We come to a consideration of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. These two chapters, chapters 8 and 9 in 2 Corinthians, are probably the classic or the premier passages in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, gives us very detailed instruction uh, by way of both example and injunction as to what we should be seeing and doing when it comes to the issue of handling our finances in a godly way. Our narrow focus this morning will be just the first couple of verses in chapter 8 at high speed as I seek to extract some key principles for us. Uh, I'm mindful of the fact that there's a lot more to be said through the, the balance of that chapter and indeed into chapter 9, but I will touch on a couple of the relevant verses on the way through our time together this morning. And I trust that last week and this week then hang together in our collective thinking as we consider this issue of what we do with our assets and our resources and our money in a godly way. But folk, with that in mind, let's bow together in prayer and ask for the help of the Lord by His Spirit to indeed come and teach us and instruct us and lead us into all truth this morning. Let's pray together. Almighty and most gracious God, we do come and humble ourselves before you mindful of the immense blessings that you pour out upon us. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
you own the cattle on a thousand hills. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. We are mindful that even in terms of what we have, that everything comes from you. That every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change as the shifting shadows. Thank you, Lord, for opening up your good hand in so many ways for us individually and in our families and for us as a local church. We're mindful even of our brother Chris prayed a little bit earlier, drawing reference to the financial position even of our own church. And God, you have been good. You have been gracious. You have been kind. We don't deserve anything from you, but we recognize that you have blessed, that you have sustained, and we continue to look to you as the giver of all good things to achieve that. And even as we come to these issues this morning, which is so risk-laced with the issue of coercion and manipulation and ungodly agendas as we deal with these crucial practical themes, Lord, I do pray that you would bring balance, bring grace, uh, correct any overcooking or undercooking of the approach that I'm taking. And Lord, I do pray that um, we would not look to ourselves or beating ourselves up or uh, guilt tripping each other in any way in terms of these issues, but that we would continue to look to our Father who art in heaven, that you would indeed give us our daily bread as a local church. Lord, we are thankful for the fact that we indeed know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We consider him who, though he was rich in glory and in splendor, uh, in, in an eternally uh, perfect relationship with, with the triune God, made himself poor, taking on the form of a servant. He humbled himself, coming down into the sin-affected mess, so that through his poverty, through his humiliation, through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection, we indeed might become rich and enjoy the every spiritual blessing that we have in our sufficient Savior. And Lord, as we look to him as the example, Lord, we do pray that we would be moved and stirred in response to that, to give that which we need to for the honor and the glory of your name and for the extension of your kingdom here on earth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Folk, if we were to track through history, it is clear to see that the kingdom of God and the ministry of the church and the cause of world missions has always been fueled and established and uh, sustained by the faithful giving of faithful godly Christians. We could, for example, go back into the 1700s and consider the work of Andrew Fuller, the Baptist pastor in Kettering in the United Kingdom. And uh, he was uh, intricately involved with the w establishment of the London Baptist Missionary Society and uh, the, the sending out of William Carey to India. But what uh, Andrew Fuller did particularly well was cementing the idea of holding the rope. If somebody is going down the well, somebody on the outside needs to hold the rope to support them. And as Carey and others were sent out onto the foreign fields for the cause of Christ and the gospel, uh, Fuller promoted this idea that there needed to be a team at home that was supporting and giving and floating that ministry and indeed being in prayer for that. God's kingdom can't be extended uh, without the pounds and the pence at that time that was needed for that particular work. We jump about a century and consider the example of uh, C.T. Studd, the English cricketer who inherited a massive fortune from his father. Uh, but Stud was so gripped with the cause of Christ and the gospel and the kingdom of God and world missions that even as he was preparing to leave his very comfortable life in terms of sport and uh, circumstances in the United Kingdom to come across to Africa as a missionary, made plans to give away virtually everything of that vast fortune that he inherited from his father. China Inland Mission and the work of Hudson Taylor was floated through that. The establishment of Moody Bible Institute in Chicago was established through Studs Giving. Uh, the work of the Salvation Army was spawned by that and continued to be floated by that, both in uh, Great Britain and across in other parts of the world as well. George Mueller's orphanages in London were beneficiaries to a large degree of Studs' fortune. 
and the work and the ministry of the kingdom of God was floated by a godly man consumed with the glory of God and the work of the kingdom that he didn't hold on to that with both hands uh, with greed, but he saw the, the need to give that away for the cause of Christ's name. It's not new. As we go back into scripture, we can certainly see godly people with hearts motivated by a desire for, flowing from a, a godly desire of worship giving to the Lord. We look at Mary, for example, there in John chapter 12, who took that uh, alabaster jar of costly ointment and anointed the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ with that. Many would look at that and say it's rank stupidity, as Judas did. It could have been sold for a vast price and so forth. But she, as an act of worship to the Lord, gave everything that she had in that particular way. We look, for example, at the church in the early chapters of Acts of the Apostles as they lived in community with each other and saw the needs and felt the pain of their brothers and sisters in Christ. And those that had assets and land and property oftentimes would sell that to liquidate that, to give so that others could benefit from that. This is not early for, uh, some form of early communism, but a real sense of fellowship and togetherness as they uh, felt the needs in their own community. The Apostle Paul, as he did work and ministry and traveled around as an itinerant evangelist and a missionary and church planter, was often funded and floated by local churches. And as he writes to the church in Philippi, in Philippians chapter uh, 4, he actually tells them, you've given me too much, you're almost oversupplying my need. You can hit the brakes a little bit, you're doing so well in terms of your provision. We turn, for example, to the book of 3 John, uh, right there at the end of the New Testament. And uh, John makes the point that there had been people, strangers, who had come into the midst of that local church. And there in verses 7 and 8, he says to them, now that they have gone out for the sake of the name, they have been sent out for the cause of Christ and the gospel to evangelize and do ministry and do missions among, uh, amongst others, Therefore, we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers for the truth. We ourselves are not going out, they're going out, but we need to pay for them to go. And there's an injunction that lies on local churches just like ours to be fellow workers in the cause of the gospel through our own giving. Giving is both the privilege and the requirement for devout godly Christians where you have devout godly Christians that are consumed with God and the gospel and the work of the kingdom, there is a very real sense that finances will flow not as an act of coercion, but as an act of true worship. Well, folk, we pick up on those themes this morning, just piggybacking onto Malachi chapter 3. And the church that comes into focus this morning, in fact, is not one church, but three churches in the area of Macedonia in ancient Greece. And what we will see is they didn't have particularly much. In fact, they were particularly cash-strapped. They weren't uh, in the black. They were severely in the red, as it were, in terms of their own situation. But they gave freely and they gave cheerfully, not just for their own work internally, but further afield. And we will need to be struck by that. As we explore their example this morning, we will see various principles emerging. And I do trust that without any sense of... Uh, coercion or manipulation that the Lord graciously would stir within all of us uh, to be responding to what he wants us to respond to. How we see our money, our assets, our time, our resources, how we manage that and how we shape our thinking around those themes, particularly in the context of our local church here at the Rainbow Baptist Church this morning. So, folk, with that in mind, before we even come to the first couple of verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, let me just set the scene for you. As I said in this chapter, the Apostle Paul is calling on his readers in the church of Corinth to be giving. But what he does is he reminds them of the example of these other churches out in the area of Macedonia. The church at Corinth had already been reminded by Paul that they ought to be giving. And uh, don't, don't turn there, but we read there that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1, where he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints... As I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. 
So about a year before he writes to uh, to Corinthians, Paul has already directed the attention of this church that they need every single one of them every single week on the first day of the week, on the Sunday, to be bringing contributions that would come into the storehouse that would be gathered together for the purpose of reaching out to the broader gospel ministry uh, all the way across in Jerusalem where believers were also struggling. But as Paul loops back to that and puts pen to paper in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he doesn't just come with theology, but he outlines the example of these churches in Macedonia. Uh, The church at Philippi, the church at Thessalonica, and the church at Berea would be those three churches that he is referring to. And Paul holds them up as a wonderful example of giving churches. They were devout Christians, and they were behaving in a very, very generous way in the matter of their giving. And so as Paul comes to teach on the issue of giving, he does it using them as an example of what other believers in Corinth and through the centuries and through the millennia, right down to us today at the Rainbow Baptist Church, should be seen and doing. As they did, so we ought to be doing as well. And I trust you'll see the the elements of their giving emerging this morning. And uh, what we want to consider is what made them particularly exemplary. Uh, What were they doing right? How did they give? With what spirit did they give to the Lord's work and to local church and to missions? And uh, what can and should we be learning from that this morning? So again, folks, there's a huge amount too that we could poke and prod into. But uh, all I'm really wanting to do is just look at the first couple of verses and uh, this morning draw out eight principles, just eight simple principles uh, that I think will provide some balance to where we were uh, last Lord's Day in Malachi. So then we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and let's just work through these verses and uh, see what the Lord would say to us this morning. Principle number one that we see emerging from this passage is that God's grace fuels giving. God's grace at work in our lives and our hearts fuels giving. And we can see that there in verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that is being given among the churches of Macedonia. Folks, it's crucial that we get that. Paul roots this whole idea of giving and resources and how we handle the issue, not in a question of rands and cents and bank balances and calculators, but in the grace that we have received from God. We have been saved by His grace. For it is by grace that we're saved through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. God's grace breaks into our lives as lost, damned, hell-bound sinners, and He rescues and He redeems and He draws to Himself and He justifies us with the very righteousness of Christ and adopts us into His family, and it is all His grace. You do nothing to warrant that or to deserve that in any way. Everything that you have as a Christian in terms of the spiritual resources and the blessings of Christ are yours because of God's grace at work in your life. Not only does he save us by grace, but he transforms us by grace as well as we read in Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Folk, that was true for the believers in the first century. That was true for the churches of Macedonia. That was true for the church at Corinth. That's true for us here this morning. Grasp how fundamental and foundational this is. God brings saving faith into our lives by His grace. He achieves salvation in us by His grace. His continued work of sanctifying us and conforming us to the, to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ is by His grace. The very fact that we can have the mind of Christ and set our mind on things above, not on earthly things, is a mark of His grace in our lives. We've been saved by grace, we've been transformed by grace, we're sanctified by grace, and that means as a result of God's grace in our lives, our thinking and our perspectives, and our attitudes, and our agendas, and our inclinations are being pulled in a more Godward, heavenly direction. 
We don't do that to ourselves. It is because he has saved us and effected that change. And that means how we view possessions and how we view our resources and our finances and our money and our giving has been changed and is continuing to be changed as God graciously works in our lives. The level of giving that we commit to and the level of sacrifice that we have is unique to those that have been touched and transformed by his grace. And Paul says there in verse 1 that was unique to the Macedonian churches. The life of Christ as a result of God's grace was bubbling out of them with a desire to give as they had received. Freely, freely we have received and so freely, freely we want to give because they were so consumed by what God had done to them. But this is foundational and we need to rest on this solidly this morning. Only the Christian can do this. Yes, I will concede that unbelievers can be charitable. They can, be in, they can give they can give their arms, their charitable giving, money in a money box, and be involved in community projects and pick up litter along the Bromfontein Sprite and hand out food parcels and get involved with Gift of the Givers and all of the wonderful, commendable work they do across our own country and beyond. But that's motivated by a concern for people. That's just humanistic phil- ph- uh, philanthropy at play. The Christian who is gripped by the the grace of God and transformed on the inside by what God has done for him in Christ is responding to need around out of a redeemed heart with new attitudes, with new desires, with a heavenly perspective, with eternity in mind and with the glory of God dominating the man or the woman who is in Christ. And so as we sit here this morning, I'm not coming to say just give more for some reason But if we are truly grasping that which God has done for us, that should be the platform, the trampoline, as it were, that we actually bounce from in terms of our giving because we are so uh, gripped by what we have in Christ as a response to Him and what He's done by grace. In fact, with that in mind, just flick across, if you would, to chapter 9. Chapter 9 and just the last couple of verses and we can see how Paul rounds off the whole, uh, his, his whole set of thinking with these, these words. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 picking up at verse 13. By their approval of the service they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your con- contribution for them and all others while they long for you and pray for you. Why? because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. The inexpressible gift is Christ. The inexpressible gift is that which we have in Christ as we're united to him by faith. As we grasp salvation in God's grace, that is the, the source, the fountain of everything that we will be considering this morning. Not just a, not just a desire for the upliftment of people, but a response to the Lord's gracious intervention in our lives. So firstly, we need to see that grace is both motivated and fueled and shaped by the grace, or giving at least is fueled and motivated by the grace of God. But the second principle that we see in these verses as we move through verse 1 and 2 is that circumstances do not hinder devoted giving. One circumstances are not to be a hindrance for devoted giving. But let's just understand the pressures that are at play as Paul puts pen to paper. And we may well resonate with that to a degree this morning. These Greek Christians had a tough. It was tough to be a Christian in the first century. It was tough to follow Christ and to name the name of Christ. They would bear suffering and loss as a result of hearing the gospel and responding to the gospel and calling themselves Christians. Believers in the first century, and we can see it mirrored through many of the letters and even through the, uh, the, two, church, uh, the, the, the two chapters on the churches of, uh, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 as Paul deals with those issues. They often lost family, they lost friends, they lost their prospects, there, were, uh, econo- there was economic deprivation in terms of losing business oftentimes as well. They suffered for the cause of Christ. 
And folk, not a whole lot has changed through the centuries. If uh, you follow the work and the ministry of Open Doors and uh, see what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Christ across the globe, even today in 2023, there are men and women who are suffering for the cause of Christ through job loss and deprivation and arrests and exclusion and beatings and imprisonments, etc. Nothing's changed. That's always been the case. As they persecuted me, they will also persecute you, said the Lord Jesus Christ. A servant is not above his master. We should expect that to happen. It was happening then and it was happening happening now and that impacted their own safety and security but also their economics and look at how Paul writes here in, in in these verses about the churches of Macedonia for in a severe test of affliction their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part they weren't having it easy they were in a severe test of affliction Severe means big, it means mega, it means large, it's grand. This was overwhelming stuff that they were facing. And they were going through the furnace, as it were, being refined by God as they suffered for the cause of Christ with a sense of crushing um, oppression upon them all the time. What these believers were facing in terms of their lives was not Mickey Mouse stuff. Not some lightweight opposition where somebody doesn't want, want to talk, uh, talk to you or, or goes to you in a, in a particular way. This church faced crushing oppression all the time. And the result of that was very real poverty linked with their persecution. Extreme poverty is the way Paul describes it in these verses. They were down in the depths in terms of their own circumstances. Now I guess painting that picture you would think that would be the time when they would legitimately be able to say we've got to look out for ourselves we've got to log in here and protect ourselves in a particular way we've got all these tremendous difficulties because of the circumstances and and the persecution we're facing not just the threat but economic loss as well we we we, we can't we can't give in in a particular way we've got our own problems we're too poor to give. We're too consumed with staying alive every single day. But it's interesting. In the midst of the intense suffering and the deprivation, these three churches in Macedonia still gave. It's intriguing to see how their focus was not on themselves. They were thinking about other people whom they hadn't even met. And that's the amazing part. They would probably never ever get to meet those believers in the broader church across in Jerusalem. Never get to know them personally. Never be able to sit with them and have a prayer meeting together with them. And yet as they heard that need and thought about the bigger issues of the church of Jesus Christ in the first century, out of their own terrible distress and the crushing affliction that they were facing, they gave to minister to the body of Christ in a place far removed from where they were at. Well, can you see the grace of God at work? This is not natural. This is not something that can be whipped up. This is not something that can be coerced. This is the Spirit of God stirring within a Christian who has been bought and redeemed and purchased by Jesus Christ. Devout believers are not bound by circumstances. They're not bound by the hardship that they have. A love for God and a love for His people, be it in their own local church or further afield, grips and compels them to rise above the circumstances to a life and an attitude of faithful kingdom-minded giving even though it's hard and even though it costs and we're going to see that this morning look as we consider this issue of circumstances we don't in any way want to do that in some super spiritual vacuum as we sit here in july 2023 at the rambo baptist church i get it you get it. We know the realities that we, we live with. We live with rising food costs. We live with pay cuts. We live in some sad instances, even within the church, of retrenchments. We know what it's like to see the uh, petrol price going up and up and up, and even the gas prices going up and up and up, and we need that, don't we, as well. We, we know the interest rate escalations and how that impacts you in terms of some of the loans that you have. Those are the realities that we face. I know that even sitting here this morning, I can see you because I know that you're here. Some of our folk live day to day with no running water and no power. 
Some of us have just been impacted over the last 48 or 72 hours with that. But there is a daily reality for some of our people in terms of where they're at, where that is a daily struggle. Some of our people don't just jump in their cars on a Sunday morning and come across here, but are waiting an hour, two hours, three hours on the side of the road for the taxi to fill up so that they can even come to worship on a Sunday because that's the realities that our people are dealing with. I'm not in any way trying to escape the hardship and the deprivation and the circumstances that we are in, even in the northwest of Johannesburg at this particular point in time. We're not unaware, folk, of the, the pressures and the issues and the burdens and what it means to be cash-strapped on a regular basis. But I guess the Word of God speaks to us and says, just consider focus. Even in the midst of that, let's not run the risk of becoming so narrow and so selfish that we forget others and have become so self-consumed about our own issues that we become less heavenly minded about the big issues, about eternity and God and God's kingdom. This is in no way a guilt trip at all. I'm not standing here with some agenda to push sinful pressure on you and ungodly coercion. But folk, even in small ways, even in small amounts, let's not lose sight on the, uh, of a focus on the kingdom of God and the need to support his purposes even from within our own hard circumstances and the adversity that we may well be facing in terms of our own lives at this particular point in time. So giving transcends circumstances. Linked with that and flowing from that, we move to another principle that flows from verse 2. And so thirdly this morning, we need to see that joy is a mark of giving. Giving should be joyous, it should be exuberant, and we want to see that. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. In fact, this flows from what we've just seen. God's grace fuels our giving. It's not forced, it's not pressured, it's not manipulated or guilt-tripped. There is no sense of compulsion here at work, as, as Paul writes. No one was forcing these churches to give. No one was standing behind them with a, a shambok or, a, or whipping them to give part of their money or all of their money in a particular way. No one was going around visiting them on a monthly cycle with a, a book in hand and a calculator give, forcing them to, to give their tinder or manipulating them from a TV screen with a nice suit promising them a, a wealth of a whole lot of stuff if they would just but give lots. Their experience in Macedonia was a joy in terms of giving. They delighted in being able to support the ministry of their own church and missions and further afield, even into Jerusalem and beyond. And Paul holds them up as an example. They gave out of their severe affliction and the abundance of their poverty with joy, with gladness. There was no reluctance. There was no sense of dissatisfaction when it came to giving to the cause of Christ. These churches didn't give with long teeth or with a dickbeck kind of attitude. In fact, flick across to chapter 9 again and just see how Paul writes there as he reinforces that later on. Verse 7, chapter 9, verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For what? For God loves a cheerful giver, a joyous giver. Not one who's been conned or manipulated into to giving. And I guess, folk, that begs the question for us this morning is, do we have that same sense as we come to consider the work of God, the work of his local church, the work of kingdom? May God graciously guard us from any sense of obligation. May God guard us all from any sense of manipulation, even from maybe me even this morning. May he stir within us through the work of his spirit, consumed by his grace as we saw up front, and thoughts of eternity to be faithful and joyous in terms of that which we are called to do, to be so consumed with the desire to see his fame made known that we are motivated to give joyously with the knowledge that the earth indeed will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. 
if I've got that in mind, you may well be sitting here going, well, those are nice principles, but, but how? What do I actually do practically? How do I put some nuts and bolts onto this when I'm looking at my paycheck, when I'm looking at my bank balance, when I'm looking at what I actually bring maybe on, on Sunday to put into the offering bag at the doors, etc. Uh, Gavin, I heard you last week that maybe we don't need to give a tithe, that it's not percentage-based, uh, that maybe those Old Testament pass, pa uh, passages aren't pulled through directly in terms of where we're at. Well, if that's the case, how do I give? How should my thinking be shaped? And Paul knows we're going to ask those questions, and so he continues to give us answers in that way. And so fourthly, this morning, let's consider that generosity shapes our giving. Generosity shapes our giving. I guess we all like to part with as little cash as we can, right? I mean, when we're shopping, we check out the specials and uh, go through those printouts that pad the Randberg Sun where there's about one, one, print, uh, one page of newsprint and about 40,000 pages of adverts. And we go through that and we shop out the sh specials and we make sure that we go and grab the cat food even when we don't have a cat, etc., because it's cheap. And, you know, we, we know what it's like if you're a vehicle owner. You're the one who is screaming out to the, the engine and the, the Celtics at about 11.53 on a Tuesday evening before the first Wednesday of the month because you want to catch the petrol price before it goes up by, I was going to say three cents a litre, but it's usually more than that, right? You're the one who quite rightfully is paying a tax consultant to ensure that SARS doesn't get more than they ought to out of uh, your, 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 your paycheck. Folk, that's wise. That's, that's wise living, that we're prudent in terms of uh, not being irresponsible, that we're good stewards of the money that we actually have. But if we push that far enough, it could drive us into the realm of selfishness and greed. And I guess the same could apply even to our approach to the Lord's work. How often we actually sit and we are, we're asking the question, what is the prescribed bare minimum that I can get away with? What is the prescribed bare minimum that God would be happy with? How do I sit with my abacus and my calculator and my slide rule and whatever it is that you're using to, to just make sure that I'm staying on the right side of what the, the word calls me to, but I don't want to give a cent beyond that because, hey, that's going to keep my stakes up with God. Look, have a look there at the example of the Macedonians. And again in, in verse 2. For in a severe test of affliction... Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Their giving over, abounded in the wealth of their liberality and their generosity. If you can think, maybe if you saw the news feeds of the recent floods down in the, the Western Cape, watch some of those rivers and those streams bursting, their banks overflowing, abounding. That's kind of the, the picture that the Apostle Paul is using here in the, in the Greek as he, as he writes this, this uh, overflowing uh, sense of abounding and liberality. It's, it's, it's gushing out of them. It's a fountain. It's a well that just can't be contained, flowing over the brim. Again, folks, don't miss the point that these Christians were poor, they were struggling, they were poverty-stricken, and yet even in their own circumstances, their giving literally overflowed. We don't get a sense that they were sitting with their calculators trying to work out that minimum amount. Can I get by with 9.9% in this particular month? If we do that, what happens to my expenses? What happens to my responsibilities? How do I handle the biblical need to support my own family in a particular way? Those are issues that we need to bear in mind as well. There is a wealth of generosity, but what we need to see even inherent in this passage is a sense that it's balanced with responsibility. There are other guidelines that the Apostle Paul actually gives to them as he exhorts them to love God, as he exhorts them to love people, as he exhorts them to be consumed with the purposes of God. It's, it's counterweighted in such a wonderful way in terms of responsibility. But if anything, don't miss the fact they're in our uh, fourth point that generosity shapes giving and flowing from that and linked with that as we move into verse 3 fifthly give as you are capable of giving give what you are capable of giving how does Paul start off there in verse 3 for they gave according to their means 
as I can testify. They gave according to their ability. They gave according and in proportion to what they have. According to their own capacity, according to their own resources, uh, these people were motivated to give. Folks, that's crucially important for us this morning. God in no ways is advocating that we be unwise. He's in no way advocating that you compromise yourself and your own family and go against other clear biblical examples to take care for your family or otherwise we would be, be regarded as even worse than an, an unbeliever. God is not in any, any way saying when you hear a sermon like that that you go and start rushing down to the ATM and drawing cash on credit just so that you can give to the work of the Lord. God in no way is, is advocating that we go into further debt just because of you hear church financial need and you start digging into your, your own um, mortgage or home loan or whatever the case might be. God is not in any way saying that you renege on your school fees or don't pay your doctor's bills just because you hear Gavin Johnston on a Sunday morning preaching about the issue of giving and you're guilt tripped into giving more. The Lord is not in any way pushing us in that way. But he does expect us to be giving out of what we do have. As I mentioned last week, Sunday, and I just want to loop back to that, I'm maintaining that we as Christians in the New Testament era are not obliged to be giving a fixed amount on a prescribed tithe, although other, others would uh, disagree and we respect that. But folk, I think it's clear that there is enough biblical evidence that challenges us to look at that which we do have. And before God in response to his grace, to prayerfully and wisely consider that which we do have and then to give accordingly and proportionately in that regard. And folks, that makes sense. It just makes absolute sense to us. And you can see how wise uh, the Apostle Paul is as the Spirit of God directs him. If you think of our own church, we've got folk here who are in reasonably low-paying jobs in a variety of different workspaces, and they would struggle. They would really, really struggle in terms of finding significant cash to give to the Lord's work. Maybe 1% or 2% of their, their income every month is all that they can contribute, all that they're capable of, but they're still called to give out of what they do have. And folk, at the same time, we're mindful that we've got people here that are in top corporate positions in high-paying jobs with significantly more disposable income. And if that's just being capped at 10%, we're in a sense robbing the Lord by not bringing out of the generosity of what he has actually blessed us with because we can give so much more. And so the challenge lies before us. What do we have and how do we respond to that in ways that bless uh, the church and uh, enable the work of the kingdom. But sixthly, giving is also to be sacrificial. Sixth, sixthly, giving is to be sacrificial. Again, look there at verse 3. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, comma, and beyond their means of their own accord. Paul, in a sense, goes against what he's just said, doesn't he? I mean, if you're a thinking person, you're thinking, Gavin, what's happening? This is a direct contradiction of what we've just said. You've just said give proportionately and wisely, and here we see the sacrificial angle beyond their own means. What's Paul saying? Look, I think we just need to see that this is God-given wisdom, and there is God-given balance here, laced and undergirded by a trust in God. Paul is reminding these Corinthians of what... Uh, he would, in, in fact, write later, again, just flick across to chapter 9, chapter 9 for a moment and have a look at verse 11, and just see the promises, just see the promises of God's provision for his people, and I think this would undergird this issue, as he says, give beyond your means. Have a look at there at chapter 9, verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Folk, the focus here is about good work, 
It's about the kingdom. It's about ministry. It's not about your own assets. It's not about your own bank balance. It's not about you growing richer and richer and richer. The whole thrust of Paul's writing here is about becoming rich for the cause and the glory of God, that uh, ministry is not hindered in any way. But what he's reminding them of is this, that God would supply all of their needs. He's bringing them back to a robust trust in God. God takes care of his children. God takes care of his church. God extends his kingdom. And uh, we need to rest and trust in that. And so Paul writes to them in uh, chapter 8 verse 3, give beyond your means. Yes, it's proportionate. Yes, there's a, a wisdom that needs to, to, to be at play. But at the same time, won't you trust him at times to go beyond that which you think you're able to and uh, realizing that you can't in any way outgive God? This is not a call for stupidity. This is not a call to throw wisdom out of the window. Uh, but this is a desire to think big and to think boldly for the cause of Christ and the gospel, realizing that you can't outgive him in any way. And linked with that, seventhly, giving is to be voluntary. Giving is to be voluntary. They're at the tail end of verse 3 into verse 4. They gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, sacrificially, of their own accord, of their own initiative. They were self-motivated. They were spontaneous in this issue. They made wise choices, sacrificial choices, as they considered that which they had. Had they chose their own course of action, these believers were not coerced. They were not manipulated. They were not intimidated. They were not bribed by any pastor or visiting evangelist or white-clad individual on a TV screen. They weren't duped into giving by a promise of some trickery or some gimmick that was enticing them to part with their hard-earned cash. Their giving was out of their own hearts as they so decided in response to God's grace and as an act of worship to God. Okay, let's just hit the pause button there just briefly before we come to the final principle. Those last three aspects that we've considered this morning, giving that is proportionate, giving that is sacrificial, and giving that is voluntary, really sums up, I think, the idea of New Testament free will giving. We give proportionately to, to what we have. We give in a way that is sacrificial, but we don't do it in a prescribed way, but we do it as we so choose of our own accord. But this is giving from the heart. Whatever you so decide before God in response to His grace, you give, and you give it voluntarily, you give it proportionately, you give it sacrificially as you have so decided. And in many ways, what we see here just in that verse is the very core, the very kernel, the very heartbeat, as it were, of essential free will, voluntary giving to the Lord's work that the rest of the New Testament, in a sense, hangs on. You give whatever you want to give, Realizing that what you sow to the Lord's work and to his kingdom will reap a harvest of immense blessing. Not for your own selfish purposes, but for the cause of his kingdom and for the glory of God. You give and it will be given to you. You can't outgive God. And that's the point that again Paul makes there in chapter 9 and verse 6. The point is this, he says. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Not motivated by selfish issues at all, but consumed with big, glorious, high, eternal kingdom purposes. And that leads us to our last principle that we want to consider this morning. That giving is a privilege. That giving is a privilege. I guess we've all seen them. It's the dude that's trying to sell his homeless talk at the intersection or trying to get some money from you with his little piece of cardboard and uh, the notes sketched on that about his circumstances and life and family and so forth. And there's very, very um, uh, real need around us. But fuck, if you can imagine somebody who's particularly hard-pressed and afflicted and he's desperate for some handout, for some food, for some money, you get a sense of the earnestness. You get a sense of the 
almost aggressiveness in terms of asking for that particular issue. And that is the word that the Apostle Paul uses here in verse 4. Begging us earnestly. Begging us passionately. Begging almost with a sense of aggression, not to get money, but to give money. They were begging us earnestly for what? For the favor or for the privilege of taking part in the relief of the saints. These churches beg Paul with much passionate exhortation, grant us the privilege, grant us the grace to be part of this ministry, to reach out even from within our affliction and our poverty in a way that makes a significant difference for the cause of Christ and the gospel. We love God, we're touched by his grace, we're moved by the plight of our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. Paul, we want to be part of that. We want to partner with you. We want to bring that. We, we want to be able to give in that particular way. Can you see it? This is not manipulated. This is not coerced. These were devout Christians, and giving is the behavior of devout Christians, with no reluctance, with no resistance, but with a great sense of joy. Folk, again, as we just look at the example of the Macedonians held up before us this morning through this portion of Scripture, it begs the question, is our own giving like that today? Do I do we within our families, do we as a local church look at these issues, these opportunities, uh, these ministries, these mission, missions organizations, and we plead with God, grant us the grace to be able to be part of that ministry for the glory of Christ and for the extension of his kingdom. And so folks, with that in mind, I just want to tie the threads together. And I think you would have seen really where I wanted to go just by way, by way of a supplement to Malachi chapter 3 last week. But what we encounter here, just briefly in these opening verses of chapter 8, is the example of the Macedonian churches. We see that giving is to be initiated and motivated and fueled by the grace of God. This is something that only a Christian can do, uh, one who is actually in the kingdom. And incidentally, if you're not a believer, don't in any way think that you can earn God's favor by giving money and giving resources and giving time. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And in response to that, the, the good works and the opportunities for ministry and giving come. But this is a believer's privilege. Secondly, we've seen that it's uh, giving transcends circumstances, both in terms of persecution and in terms of poverty. We've seen that giving is a joyous act. It is to be generous. It is to be proportionate. It is to be sacrificial. It is to be voluntary. And then finally and eighthly this morning, we've seen that it is a privilege, something that we need to be earnestly uh, desirous of being involved in without any sense of obligation at all. Folks, as we look at the Macedonian churches and hold that up together with Malachi chapter 3, can you start to see how this is couched in a relationship with the Lord? How this flows from an attitude of worship? This is not drudgery. This is not prescription. The Lord says to his people back in Malachi, return to me and I will return to you. Stop forsaking my statutes. Just do that which is right. And God, in a sense, is saying to us this morning, return to me and I will return to you, not with a system of prescribed percentages, but as you've been touched and gripped by the grace of God, give generously, proportionately, sacrificially, voluntarily as a privilege. We're called to, and that is part of our worship of our God, with the understanding that God loves that, that he blesses that. Indeed, he blesses and loves the cheerful giver. So I leave that with you this morning. Where does that leave us as a local church community? Where does this leave us as a local church or as local church members? The Lord has given us very clear instruction in his word about supporting ministry and the work of the kingdom, not least of which within our own local church community. We're called to be involved financially in supporting 
the work of ministry of this church in terms of the staff, in terms of the full-time leaders, in terms of paying the utilities bills and the rates and taxes and property and all the operational expenses. We're called to be ensuring that there are funds available for community work and outreach and missions in our Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost ends of the, the earth. And praise God that is continuing and we're not lacking in that way. The Lord calls us to be part of his work in dreaming big thoughts or having big thoughts about big, glorious, eternal, kingdom-minded themes. And our little contributions can go a long way in terms of fueling the cause of God in our own generation. May God be gracious to us as we obey. And maybe he be faithful to his promise, even as we commit to be more faithful in our giving. Because God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you and I and us may indeed abound in every good work for the glory of his name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the immense riches that you give to us in so many different ways. It might not be a massive bank balance and uh, huge earthly assets that we have in terms of property and vehicles and uh, other investments, but Lord, we are thankful for the fact that we indeed have a treasure uh, in our relationship with you. We're called, even in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, to invest in the heavenly treasure where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. We're called to set our mind on things above where Christ is. And so, Father, we do pray without any sense of, uh, again, manipulation or extortion, that you would just use our reflections both last week and this morning to stir us in terms of that which we need to be doing, uh, to see your kingdom coming with increasing measure on earth as men and women and young people are touched by the great truths of the gospel as funded and floated uh, by the ministry that we're called to sustain. Lord, we want to see Christ ruling and reigning over everything. We are mindful that even now all things are put under his feet. We long to see more people coming to a place where indeed they acknowledge the reign of Christ. He reigns over all the earth. But Lord, we do pray for increasing reign in the hearts and lives of people as uh, the gospel impacts them. Grant us the privilege to be part of that, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Yeah, the benediction from Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.